It's Welcome recording. everybody to our third or fourth SDB Connect. Each week seems to move into the next week. Um, I'm Judy Mark. I am the president of Disability Voices United and the parent of a 23-year-old son with autism who is wearing a mask like everyone else should be. Not on this call, but when you leave your home. So I guess that's my first public service announcement is that people should be wearing masks wherever they go. Um, so uh, we're gonna get started today with um, a, a um, chart that I spent a ridiculous amount of time on creating last November for our self-determination conference, as well as a set of, um, uh, what you call it, um, checklists for, so you can see the flow of the self-determination program. I've been hearing from a lot of participants that individuals are being told by their regional centers to go, that you, oh, you have to have finished your person-centered plan before we'll talk to you about your individual budget. That is not true. Um, we're being told, you know, people have, have to have, you know, certain things in their spending plan, which is also not true. So we're gonna try to go through it step by step and so that you know, it, one of the, you can answer one of the biggest questions I get with is what's next? We've gone through the orientation, we don't know what to do next, or where do we even start? And hopefully this will help you a little bit. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, bummer, I got rid of the document. Please hold for one moment and I will get the document. This, by the way, what I'm sharing is available in both Spanish and English um, in our lovely uh, book called Think Outside the Box, which you can order on our website in the publication section. Um, and that way you can uh, use it and fill it out and make little checkbooks, check, check marks showing that you've done that. So I'm now going to share my screen. All right, so what do I do next is the, oh, before I move on, I should just say, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for just a second, that you, if you want to ask a question, um, what you should do is click on the bottom of your screen under participants, and then you will see the list of participants and you will see yourself usually at the top you will also see the option to raise your hand. Like right now, I'm raising my hand, so you see in my picture, there's a little hand here. You can also lower your hand if you do it by accident. The reason why I can't have you physically raising your hand like this is because I can't see all of you on my screen. Um, so we have so many people on that it's multiple screens. So I'm gonna need you to use that function. Um, oh, I also forgot to have Lorna, our wonderful Spanish interpreter, tell folks that you can get um, on, uh, you can listen to Spanish translation through a separate phone line. Uh, so would you mind doing that, Lorna? Para todas las personas que hablan español, y quieren escuchar la interpretación simultánea del español de esta llamada, pueden llamar al número 551-241-6310. De nuevo, 551-241-6310. Y no necesitan código de acceso. Y por favor, mientras no tomen la palabra, por favor, manténganse en modo silencioso. It would be really useful if everybody would be on mute, please, and only the person speaking, so there is less, less noise on the line. Thank no, you I don't care much. if I'm on vacation today. I'm going to watch it. Okay, so um, it, please just keep your your um, your phones on mute or your your uh, uh, computer on mute um, or your Zoom on mute, I should say. Um, there's the Para Español is the number in the chat. I've also put in the chat how you can order one of these books. They, we have two books that we have written, Profiles and Self-Determination, which actually tells the story of 10 people um, in the self-determination program and how they're spending their money as well as um, stories from the pilot project and explanations of the program. Y, um, um, an e e e e e e e 
It is a very long, it has a book, it has really good worksheets for you on planning, on getting your person-centered plan uh, done. Judy, I am uh, sorry, Judy, but, we sorry but we need to put the, all the lines on mute, All please. the lines on mute, please. Thank you. Um, actually, um, if I'm going to ask, I'm not the host, so I am going to ask um, Ishita to please um, mute everyone. Okay. Okay, hopefully that will happen. She may not know how to do that. And I am no longer muted. Muted. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Anybody can unmute themselves at any time when you need to ask a question. So you'll be able to do that, but we'll try to keep you all muted throughout so that you can hear me and hear each other as well as Lorna is able to translate. Okay. So uh, back to uh, my little chart. All right, so that's this is the big question everyone asks. What do I do next? Um, and so for everyone knows that each person is different and you may do, may do things a little bit differently if you want, that is fine. What we've done is we've given you um, these steps as well as a checklist, some of which in the checklist is optional, some of which is required in the self-determination program. Um, so the first thing all of you had to do was to go through an orientation. Um, generally, they're through your regional center. It, we are hearing right now that some people are, still have to go through orientations and um, some regional centers are not providing orientation um, right now, which is, I think, very problematic. Um, we would like to hear from you. I know I, I've seen Katie Hornberger from uh, Disability Rights California um and um we uh and so we are looking at um you know trying to help you to to get you these orientations we're trying to get this information to the department of developmental services um so that you can um so that you can be part of it uh, so you, so you can get your orientation so the orientation is is clear you need to talk to your regional center about it Next, um, you need to, uh, you have two basic sections that you can be doing simultaneously. I can tell you about my own son's experience with this. Um, so you need to be working on your individual budget and, and that is something that you can do as part of an IPP team with your regional center. And you also need to create a person-centered plan. So um, I'm going to go through a lot of the details in the in the um, in in the checklist in a second. I'm so sorry, but I'm getting like texts from people who can't seem to get in, and I'm not sure why. They must not have the right link because all of you got in just without a problem. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to make sure people know how to do that. Um, and there we go. Okay. So, um, all right. So you'll see that what you need to do is, uh, let's start first with a person-centered plan. So something that you should know is that you can select uh, a planner, a person-centered planner to help you lead your plan, um, your very first plan. And we are, um, and you can, Fine. There's a whole range of people, some of them on this call, who can help you with that. That funding does not come from your budget. That funding is separate and your regional center is required to approve that. And if you have up to $2,500 to not only develop your plan, but also to assist you, to advocate for you, and to assist you um, in creating your spending plan um, and work with you on your individual budget amount. So, um, so if any of you are having problems with any of that, you know, you should really uh, also let us know on this call and we'll try to assist you. Um, so you're also, so, and we're going to get into more details on what that looks like. I'm not going to, this is not a session specifically on the person center plan. 
Um, you also, at the same time that you're working on your person-centered plan, can be starting to have these discussions and even have a final meeting on your individual budget. So I can tell you that my son had his person-centered plan in early February, and um, we had uh, we had already been having discussions all the way through January with our regional center about my son's budget. So we had a person-centered plan on a Thursday. I went in to meet with the regional center on Friday and, and agreed on a budget amount and had the budget certified that day. So it really can be happening at the same time. Um, so you would, you meet, uh, so you're, so one of the ways you're going to do it is ask for your uh, your last cost statement and and then you're going to agree on a budget. We we actually talked about that two weeks ago, um, but this can be happening simultaneous. The point of this webinar today is this is happening at the same time that you are creating your person centered plan. One does not have to happen before the other. After you have this agreement on your individual budget and you've created your person-centered plan, both of those things inform the rest of your participation in the self-determination program. So now you are looking at developing services and a spending plan to spend that individual budget amount. Remember from our previous webinars, there is a difference between the individual budget, which is just a dollar amount, and the spending plan, which is how you are spending that money in the budget. And so the first, you know, so you're identifying your services, you're identifying staff, you're, you're, you're figuring out how much they might cost if you haven't identified them yet and how much they will cost for people you have identified. You are still required to use your generic resources and you want to make that clear and you want to make sure all your services are in inclusive settings. Um, at, the, at the same time, you can be working on selecting your financial management service and your staff. You can be um, you can be discussing that. Maybe your PCP planner will be helping you identify some of these folks, or you can be doing it on your own. Um, you're hiring your service providers. You're having personal staff submit background checks, and you're signing agreements with your providers as well. Finally, when you have developed your spending plan and selected your FMS and selected some of your staff, you don't have to have selected everybody, but have an idea of what you're going to be doing. That is when you hold your IPP meeting. Now, what does your IPP meeting look like? For me, it was over the phone for three minutes and then a document was sent to us that my son signed. It was not a long process. It doesn't mean a whole thing, revisiting all these issues. All you're doing is presenting your spending plan. If the um, regional center has questions about your spending plan, we'll get to that in a little bit um, because there are certain questions they're allowed to ask and others that they're not. That IPP is then signed and sent with the spending plan to the FMS and the regional center transfers fund to the FMS, and that is how you are officially in the self-determination program. You also have to think about what, what it means to be a participant. You'll be receiving monthly statements from your FMS, ensuring that you're staying on your budget. Um, you're gonna be hiring potentially an independent facilitator to do more things for you, to help you manage your staff or to find new activities in the community. Um, you have to tell your FMS if you want to change your plan. You should know that I, um, I had a uh, change. So we approved the spending plan, had the IPP, and the next day I already changed the plan because I realized I messed up on something. It was a very small little change, but I already had to contact my FMS. I had to sign a document for the change, and I and I had to do it. And it took me like. 10 minutes. So that is how simple, unlike the traditional system that if you want to change something, you have to go through a whole process, this happens immediately. Um, and you still have to have a person-centered plan at least once a year. Um, your continuing person-centered plans can be very brief. You may say, I really like what I'm doing. This has really worked well for me. Or it may be like my needs have changed substantially over the past year. We also encourage you to attend your local advisory committee meetings. 
um, which, which are local regional center organizations or, or committees that are responsible for oversight on how the self-determination program is being implemented at your regional center. Many of you who are on this, this webinar right now uh, in this meeting are serving on your local advisory committees, and then you get to enjoy your self-determined life. So um, we're gonna now delve in to each of these areas just so that you see what we're talking about. So people really had asked for a checklist. They wanna make sure they're doing everything they're supposed to be doing. And remember that every person is different. And so this is a checklist that we have found to be useful with a lot of people. You may not be doing everything. The one, so one of the things I can tell you is that if it's a dark bolded box, it means that you have to do that. It's required by either the self-determination law or some sort of guidance that the Department of Developmental Services has gone out, has put out. There are other things that are a thin box, which are part of the self-determination program. You're just not required to do it. So under the area of person-centered planning, yes, you have to attend an orientation that is required. You are not required to use a PCP planner. You are not required to use an independent facilitator. Uh, I do strongly recommend it for the very beginning. You may not need it in future years, especially if, you're, if your needs are not changing substantially, but I highly recommend it. Um, it is important for you, you know, I consider myself an expert on person-centered planning. I've trained thousands of people on person-centered planning, and I still had a, used my PCP planning budget through the regional center to hire an outside person to lead my son's person-centered plan. And the reason I did that is because I'm too close to my son. I need like an outside eye looking in to say, why haven't you tried this? Have you thought about it this way? And it it really you get such a better outcome and such a better result. I've, ma, I've had like a lot of debates with parents about this who say to me, oh, but I know my son best. Of course you know your son best. There's no way you're gonna find a planner or a facilitator who knows your son better than you do. But that's part of the reason why you need to bring an outside person in is because you're too close to it. Maybe an outside person will be able to say, huh, have you ever tried these other things? You only know what you know. You don't know what you don't know. And so bringing people, bringing in outside people will really help you. Um, we also really, oh, I should tell you that since this is, this is from the book, we also have the pages that discuss what these are um, in this flow chart. So you can go, for example, to pages 118 through 124, which really at, um, looks at the explanation of person-centered planning and how to select an independent facilitator. Uh, what people keep asking me, how do you find them? Where is the list? There is no list. I have been always opposed to the list because it is not truly self-determination. We are so accustomed to picking everything from a list in our lives that how do we know that that works? So how do you find a person center planner? You can go to a self-determination fair. Well, now there, a lot of them are happening um, online. They're doing them through Zoom. Um, you can ask on Facebook. There's a couple of Facebook uh, groups that exist just for the self-determination program. You say, hey, I'm in the Inland Regional Center area. I'm looking for a, a planner. Uh, do you, does anybody have any recommendations? Or uh, is, are you one and I'd like to talk to you? And you interview them and you find out, you know, how many, a great question to ask is how many person-centered plans have you ever led? And the number may in fact be very low because we're just really starting the self-determination program. But if that number is low, you can ask, well, you know, what's been your experience? Can you tell me a little bit about the planning that you've done in the past? How do you, you know, my, my I'm non-speaking or my son is non-speaking. How are you going to ensure that his wishes are being met in the person-centered planning process? The other thing you can do is go to our, we have a forum on the interchange.org, the interchange.org, and uh, that, that you select self-determination and you, there's a whole section on in, independent facilitators and you can ask people, anybody have any ideas for a good independent facilitator? You, the, one of the most critical pieces of person-centered planning is pre-planning and there's a whole section of it, a whole checklist in our book and if you do not do pre-planning, if everybody shows up to the 
um, to the person-centered plan and nobody has any idea what's going on, that means you didn't do, uh, you didn't do good pl uh, pre-planning. People are asking if they can get a copy. These are not slides. This is part of the book that we have. And the reason why I'm not giving you these slides is because they need explanation. And so these slides go along in a book that is in the chat and I'll put it again. It goes in a book called, I've been seeing this called Think Outside the Box. And it's a whole book that explains all these different pieces. And it's really important for you to understand the context and not just check, oh, well, I did that, but you need to understand what you're doing. Uh, you need to hold a person-centered planning meeting. That is actually optional, which I think is a problem, but that's what it is, it's optional. And the reason why it's, uh, actually, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a problem for the first time. You need to have a planning meeting that they're, for the first time entering self-determination, because how are you gonna know that this person's wishes are being met without having a meeting about it? You may not need a meeting every single year. You may be able to just sit down with a small group without a big you know, meal and a celebration and all that stuff, which is what we do for our son. You may not need to do that every single year. You may just have like a little discussion and that and, and maybe tweak your, your person-centered plan and then move forward. So that's how come it's not required because in, we have found, remember that self-determination program is not new. It is 20, over 20 years old. It's been tested in five regional centers. And in those five regional centers, they found that they didn't need a person-centered planning meeting every single year. And then finally, you will need to develop a written person-centered plan that is attached to your, um, to your IPP. Now, some people have really beautiful person-centered plans. So I'm going to tell you a little story about my son. So well before self-determination um, was implemented, we decided we would pay privately and do a person-centered plan for my son. And we paid a lot of money. We paid for this organization to come in. It was three of them. They did pre-planning. They did. It was a beautiful a restaurant and a private room. We did all these planning things. And they created, my son is, as you know him, is obsessed with Disneyland. And they created a Disneyland map of his life. And they had Fantasyland and Tomorrowland and Frontierland. It was so beautiful. And not a single thing got implemented. Because the key part of person-centered planning is figuring out who is responsible for implementing all those things. Then we brought in another person to do his second person-centered plan a couple years later. And the person-centered plan was one page. And it was just typed with a bunch of bullets. And that was put on my son's wall. And we would look at it every day and we would say, what are we doing towards meeting these goals of his person-centered plan? And every single one of those goals got met because it, they were realistic and they were, um, we, people were responsible for implementing them. So don't get, this is just a word, you may want a beautiful person-centered plan, but don't get, um, enamored by it or fooled by the fact that you have a great, beautiful person-centered plan if it never gets implemented. Um, okay, you know what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop for a moment before we go to ind individual budget and I'm gonna take some questions um, because I think that's important to stick because I've covered a lot of stuff. So let me start um, by looking in the chat because I've been seeing a lot of stuff coming through. Um, I have put the link for the, for the book. It's in there, scroll back. Um, uh, somebody's saying they're having a very hard time with Regional Center of the East Bay, have tried to get on the wait list and can't seem to get on the list and I'm getting no help from our case manager. Any help would be appreciated. Well, I can tell you that if you give me, um, I will put my email address in the chat. And if you are not on the wait list, I have, it's, your regional center is not the only person group that can put you on the wait list. Disability Voices United can also put you on the wait list. And the training I'm doing right now is all, everything you're gonna need to know. So um, I'll put my email on here and I, I'm gonna need your, I'll put what I need from you. 
um, to put you on the wait list. But I will say that it's highly unlikely at this time that DDS is going to agree to get people off the wait list. We have uh, begged for it. We actually had uh, legislation in the budget, what's called trailer bill language, that required it and the governor and DDS basically threw it out. So um, it's unlikely to happen. Um, but it does go nationwide, I mean, sorry, statewide to all, to everyone is eligible to participate on June 7th, 2021. So we are now less than a year away, which is really great. Um, uh, uh, Peter is also asking, does the money for the person-centered plan extend past the pilot program? Um, I'm, I think you mean the phase in period. The pilot was the last 21 years and the pilot, the, so the three years implementation um, is called a phase in and we do not have an answer yet. That's an excellent question that we have asked DDS. Will people who go in statewide on June 7th, 2021, will they be eligible for that same initial person-centered planning funding? And they have not told us that yet. Um, it's actually an important little advocacy piece, Katie, that we have to remember to think about over the next year. Um, okay, let's see if there's anything else. Um, Judy, okay. there is a question if the book is in Spanish. The book is not entirely in Spanish. All of the pieces that we, that DVU personally wrote is translated into Spanish, but we didn't translate. Um, oh, and there are sections that, that the Department of Developmental Services, DDS wrote, which they had translated into Spanish, but we did not translate. There are some documents that other organizations have written and we did not translate those because um, they own, they own it and that would not be appropriate for us. But I would say that a good half to three quarters, all the best parts are translated, okay? Um, uh, I had assigned, okay, I'm gonna wait on this, on this budget question till we go over the budget. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, here's, here's an interesting question. The regional center told us that the service coordinator had to come into my child's home by law every three or five months to see if the program is working. Is this true? So that is not true because of the self-determination program. It is true if your child lives in supported living. That, has, that is a separate issue or lives, I should say, outside of the family home. Um, with, with staff support. It's called a quarterly and they're supposed to come in four times a year so that they can get an eye on the person. It's to make sure they're not being abused or they're not having any problems in the home. And that remains even in the self-determination program. If they are living with the parents, absolutely not. The regional center does not go into the home. Um, let's see. Okay. All right, great. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go. Uh, oh, uh, David, David, you can unmute yourself. Do you have a question? Yeah, I I got into back in the independent divisions SVS, so I'm on the 30 day probation. I had a question. Okay. Yeah. Um, my director's gonna call in August because then we're gonna all get together and talk about the self center plan okay. and now I, I signed into self-determination and I'm going to meet up with the facilitators on uh, uh, with my eyelash worker uh, on Zoom and then uh, Wendy and I are going to interview three of them. Perfect. That sounds great. That, that That's exactly what you need to do, David. Alyssa Jackson, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, oh, do you have one more thing? Go ahead. Do I do I do when do I start an individual budget right before the self center plan? You could start it right now, David. You should be working on it right away. Your your person centered planner should be helping you ask for a copy of your budget from your regional center right what's now. A, what's a person centered planner? 
Um, is who, did you have a person-centered plan yet, David? Uh, oh, that means what I want to do? Yeah. Uh, I want to do advocacy services. Right. So I don't know if you have done a person-centered plan yet, because, um, so you want to- Not yet. Not okay. yet. Okay. So, August. so you, you really, so let's talk later offline, and, and I want to make sure that you're going through this the right way. Okay, David? Yes, ma'am. Okay, awesome. Alyssa Jackson, did you have a question? You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, hi. Hi. Hey, good afternoon, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks, how are you? Good, good. So, um, I recently got transferred, uh, my, ca my case, I mean, mm -hmm. um, to Westside. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, do you know when um, I will see um, my new service coordinator? Uh, so um, I, I am not sure, but I would definitely call Westside Regional Center, um, call the general number and ask to speak to the person on call and tell them that you have yet to hear from your service coordinator. And if and you should you should be hearing from them right away. And if you're not, you should call back and ask to speak to someone in charge so that they get you to a service coordinator. Okay, yeah, because I called the regional center mm -hmm. and then they transferred me um, to another person. But the uh, the person um, the the voice uh, it went it went straight to voicemail. So, and when was that? When was that? This was about, let me look at my phone real quick. Let me, let me this is my call history. Let me look up. So Katie Wernberger is listening in, Alyssa, and she's saying that um, you, within 30 days of transferring to a new regional center, you should have an amended IPP, okay? Hey, Katie, do you mind putting um, an, the, the intake number for the Westside Regional Center client rights advocate because they oh, might be able to help push you through as well two days ago i called okay all right well that may it may take a few days for them to make sure who they know um so they know who, who to put you with so but but if you don't hear back i'd say from monday then definitely call again okay okay uh, thank you oh absolutely all right so we're going to move on continue on um, with some of the pieces of the individual budget. So, um, you know, we went, we've talked two weeks in a row about the individual budget, but once again, you want to get that cost statement from your service coordinator, co coordinator, which shows how much was spent on you in the last 12 months. Okay. Um, then you need to meet with your regional center about your individual budget amount. Uh, so what I've been hearing from a lot of people is that you call your service coordinator and ask for your individual budget and then months and months and months go by and you hear nothing back. That is unacceptable. That is unacceptable. So when you ask for it, whether it be by phone or in writing, you say, I would like this within seven days. You should give them a deadline. And if they don't meet that deadline, then I would write them again and say, when can I expect this? And if you don't get an answer, then you need to talk to DDS. Because I'm just hearing too many stories about people not getting responses from their, um, from their regional centers. Um, you need to, if, if it's appropriate, you need to ask for a change in the budget based on a change in circumstances or unmet need. Um, it, we went over this, that was all of last week's topic, or the week before, two weeks ago, um, that it was our topic then. And so please go on our theinterchange.org uh, self-determination page, and you will see the videos of our, previous, um, of our previous webinars where we went into detail on how you ask for a change in your budget. Um, if you do not agree on the amount that uh, of the amount of the budget that the regional center is offering you, you can file for a fair hearing. Um, the, in, a, in addition, the DDS will offer you or your regional center technical assistance and you can email them. Here's the email, 
sdp at dds.ca.gov. Once the amount is agreed upon, the regional center certifies that budget. That certification of the budget means uh, that they would have spent, they're, they're guaranteeing that they would have spent this amount of money on you regardless of whether you are in the self-determination program or not. Moving on to your checklist to create, to decide on your services and create your spending plan. So remember that your services and your spending plan are informed by your person-centered plan. One flows into the next. You cannot start on a spending plan until you have finished your, per, your person center planning. Sorry, I'm joking. So I have been hearing people having person centered plans that are all about money. That's not right. It's, it's, it's not like, well, I'm having a person centered plan, but it's a waste of time because I only have $2,000 in our budget. That is not what a person centered plan is. Person-centered plan is about your hopes and dreams. There's a whole section on it in our book. So don't, don't cut short your person-centered planning process because even if your regional center or your self-determination budget can't pay for some of it, perhaps in the planning process, you can find other ways to pay for things. Um, so here, there's, you'll see in this one, there's a lot of solid block boxes. These are all requirements. So you do need to, in your spending plan, identify services, types of staff, or specific names of staff, and items. You have to list them. It can't be like just $5,000 for community integration. You have to list them. However, you can change your person, you, I'm sorry, you can change your spending plan. My son's spending plan also has what we call placeholders. So we know that my son wants to start his own delivery business. Like he wants to deliver things. Obviously that's not gonna happen under COVID, but we have a line item there that says, you know, create, cr create a business plan using a business, you know, we're gonna, maybe hire a business planner and a web designer. And we have no idea how much that's gonna cost, but we just put in a dollar amount that we think is about right. Some people are being told that they not only have to have specific dollar amounts, they have to have signed contracts with each of these uh, service providers. That is not true. That is absolutely not true. How many of you without disabilities start out your start out July 1st today and say, I know exactly how I'm going to be spending my money over the next 12 months, particularly during the time we're living in. No one could have predicted this is what you would be doing on July 1st. And so that's how come you can just have these targets. Just remember, you can't spend more than, than is in your spending plan in a total. You can't spend more than your budget. So let's say we put a thousand dollars to create a business plan and um and a website and it it actually ended up costing three thousand dollars we're gonna have to find that two thousand dollars from somewhere else because that uh th your fms is gonna have a problem hey wait this bill these bills are coming in at a higher rate show me how you're gonna adjust other parts of your spending plan so remember that you want to write down all the things that cost money you want to think sometimes about who else can pay for it. So, okay, we know that we want staffing for 24 hours a day, and we realize that IHSS may be able to pay for some of it. So you want to make a note of that. So in our spending plan, we were very clear that certain of my son's staff was going to be paid partly by IHSS and partly by the self-determination budget. You're going to be asked about these things and maybe the insurance is going to pay for part of it. Believe me, your regional center wants to know this. Uh, for those services that the self-determination program pays for, you have to figure out the cost very specifically for those that you know and just general ideas for those other things. Um, you, as I mentioned before, all of your services need to be provided in settings that are that allow complete access to the community. Um, right now, that's pretty easy to do in most cases because uh, people are mostly staying at home right now and are not in sort of congregate programs or group programs outside of their homes. Um, 
but I'll give you an example. My son takes, um, he's in a, he's in a Jewish studies program for people with developmental disabilities. Every single person in the program is a person with developmental disabilities. Uh, I put that in my son's spending plan and my regional center said, no, nope, that's not going to, that's not going to work. I wasn't sure because he's only there for an hour and a half a week. And I wasn't sure whether that would work or not, but they're like, nope, it's, it, it's segregated. So you have to take it out. So I was like, that was fine. We've been paying for that privately for years anyway. So that's fine. We took that dollar amount and then we were able to spend that money on other things. Um, and make sure your services are on the list from TDS. This list is 26 pages long. It's also in this big giant book, the list and the definitions of all the lists. Um, there's also one, one kind of service called participant directed goods and services that a lot of things can fall under. Um, okay, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm just gonna speed through this next part because we spent all of last week about the FMS. You wanna think about the model. Please look at our recording from last week, which kind of model you want. You wanna interview the FMSs. Ask them like, okay, it's Saturday afternoon in the middle of the weekend and I need help. I need to get some money for my spending plan shifted over because of an emergency, like my wheelchair died and it needs to be fixed urgently. You, how, do, how do you get a hold of your FMS to pay for an emergency expense and how do you shift money around even if it's on a weekend? You want to know that. Um, you want to select your FMS provider. You have to form your regional center. You have to hire your staff if they're going to start right away. Um, they have to submit background checks, but they don't have to, right now during the COVID shutdown, they do not have to submit fingerprints. Um, they just have to use an alternative form that said they can if you want them to submit fingerprints, but they don't, they're not required right now during COVID, the COVID emergency, after the emergency, they are going to be required to go back and get a fingerprint. But for now, they can do a, a name check. So they'll get their ID, their, their driver's license, and their, um, their, their passport information and their, um, and their social security number. And they'll be able to run an uh, FBI check that way. Um, you should sign contracts or some sort of agreement with your providers and give them to your FMS if that's needed. And um, remember that if you're using the sole employer model, you have to arrange for insurance, um, which we talked about last week. Um, you wanna have this IPP. I told you of mine took five minutes over the phone. Um, everything gets attached so the regional center can um, verify everything and they then send your money to your regional center. Okay, um, and I think that's probably good enough. I know I've been talking for a long time. Um, so I, so if anybody has any questions or comments on what I just presented or on anything that I just, uh, that you would, you have any kinds of questions at all, I'm going to go back and see the question that I skipped um, because of, it was on what I was just about to see. Okay, so Sally Kampa said, um, I had a signed budget. What, what does certify look like? I was told by regional center that we couldn't work on the spending plan until my hearing on traditional services for unmet needs was final. Is this true? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, actually. So, I really think you can, you can start working on your spending plan, but you really can't finish in it. Finish it until you know how much money you have to spend. And so, if you are if you are going through a fair hearing about your individual budget amount, you have to wait till those that final decision has been made, so you know how much money to spend. It, you know, in some cases, I've seen where people start the self determination program with the budget that the regional center gave you because let's say let's say your budget is twenty five thousand dollars and there's an additional five thousand dollars you're having an argument or you're having a disagreement with the regional center over you may want to start in the self-determination program with the twenty five thousand dollar budget go to fair hearing for the five thousand if you win at fair hearing then you can just add that additional five thousand dollar to your budget so, but if the dollar amount is very large and it basically gives you, you know, it's, it's basically your entire self-determination program, it's probably best to wait. 
But if it's just for a small amount that it, that that you're in disagreement over, you could you could certainly move forward without it. Um, feel free if you have questions to raise your hand in the in the participant section or ask in the chat. Um, somebody was asking if it's a foster child, can they enter self determination? Um, Hmm, Katie, what would be the an the right answer for that? Um, I would actually have to pull the statute and read it. Yeah. Um, I don't think it, it would be who the guardian is, right? Yeah, I don't think it it shouldn't matter. I think it could get more difficult if it's a foster child or youth who's moving around quite a bit, which unfortunately happens a lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's just one of the barriers we see this service is generally for foster children and youth, but um, I, I don't remember seeing anything in there that would prevent it. I mean, I, I, to be 100% certain, I would have to read it again. But, um, I, I think, I certainly know that people under conservatorship can be in the self-determination program, and I don't see a foster child who may have a foster guardian um, uh, as any different as somebody who has conservatorship. So I, you know, it's just obviously the foster parent or whoever the guardian is at that time would need to um, apply for them and, and, you know, help move them through the program. Um, okay, other question. Um, yeah, this is a very big question and I'm sorry, Katie, to keep putting you on the spot, but this is another, I have been hearing this from so, so many people, this question. And that is um, that a lot of regional centers have increased people's amount of services because of COVID. So they've given them you know, different kinds of services or more respite or more personal assistance, or participant directed services or whatever, which has increased their budget, right? But, they're but when they're moving into self-determination, the regional center is saying, no, this is, this is a temporary expense and therefore it's not part of your budget. Uh, so I say no, because no. this change in circumstances is going to be here for quite a long time. But not only that, if I broke my leg and needed extra services because of my broken leg, you wouldn't decrease my budget because the plan is that I won't break my leg again next year. I, I mean... Well, and certainly your, your leg could, it's going to heal faster than COVID's going away. Hopefully. Um, <laughs> But I just, I mean, that's absurd. The, the law doesn't say, but for things we think we might should take out, the law says it is based on actual expenses of the prior year. Mm -hmm. They could have put actual expenses, comma, less expenses that were, one, you know, that were seemingly, you know, uh, extraordinary. Well, but DDS has declared it that way, Katie. So DDS ha in their budget tool specifically says one-time expenses should be deducted. Right. And like, they they're, like, like a van, like, you know, you, you, you have a modification to a van. I think, um, to me, COVID is not a van conversion. This is not a one-time expense. Yeah. For school-aged children, schools might reopen in the fall, but they are not going to reopen in the same way. Right. Your child goes to school two days a week in the fall the services that your child needs at home are very different than they were last year you know pre-covid so i i don't think that this is a one-time expense kind of a thing right so i think it's like uh, that's actually something that i think is important for dds to send out some sort of directive on because i've just heard this so continually from people that um we need to get them to weigh in um, I can tell you, even my own regional center is having a problem with this. Um, there is Martha um, has a has something in the chat that when you have a chance, Lorna, if you could, I, I translated it in the chat for you. You are so wonderful, Sabrina. Is it the one that's right below it, or no? Let me find it. It oh, starts with Martha asks. God. Is it true that if you have 20 hours of respite, but you would like to spend it on something else, that the following year the regional center will adjust the budget to only give you the amount you used for respite services, using the argument that you don't need that many respite hours? 
I'm, I'm not completely sure what you mean by this question, but remember that if you have 20 hours of respite, that comes out to a dollar amount. That dollar amount is your dollar amount for your individual budget. And it does not relate to how you're going to spend the money. There is a difference between the individual budget amount and the spending plan. There's no direct line. It's not like, oh, I get $20,000 for respite and there's a direct line to how I'm spending it. It, it, it. There's no relationship. And this is something that a lot of participants and, and many more regional centers are getting wrong. So if now here's the thing, remember that your budget is spent on the last 12 months of expenditures. So this is another question, Katie, that I've been hearing. I'm glad you're on, this is very helpful to me. Um, so another question that I've been hearing is that if somebody puts in their spending plan something like buying a computer or, um, something that, you know, buying an iPad or something that helps them communicate. Regional centers are now saying that next year, as they're looking at your spending, as at your individual budget, they will deduct things like that because you're not going to be buying a computer every year. And that that's a one time only expense. So your budget would actually be deducted for that. So that comes back to that same issue of these one time expenses. Yeah, and I think some things are truly sort of one-time expenses. Um, I think, you know, a, a, a van conversion is, is a one-time expense, you know. Um, I think that could be very different than, say, an iPad, where, you know, depending on how your family member uses that iPad, I actually think it might not be unusual to need a, a new iPad every year. I mean, I mean, I buy a new cell phone every two years, mm -hmm. and I take pretty good care of my cell phone. You're right. I'm pretty careful. Um, and so if someone's using an iPad, particularly as a communication device, taking it everywhere, you know, things get dropped, what have you, I, I don't know that that's that unreasonable to expect that every year it may need a new one. I mean, battery life dies, what have you. So I think it's really looking at each individual item to make a determination of, is this truly a one-time expense or is this something that may well have to be replaced? And, and an iPad, something that's portable and carried around with you may be different than say a desktop computer. Mm -hmm. uh, that next year you might need not need a new computer, but what you might need is a new keyboard and a new mouse. You know, right. the computer itself is fine, but the computer and mouse you would need to replace. So that expense could be significantly reduced for next year, mm -hmm. and that would be reasonable. Uh, so I, I think, unfortunately, we're not going to have an easy answer mm -hmm. of what is truly a one-time expense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Harvey, did you want to say something? Or Connie, I'm not sure which one of you. It's me. Um, that is an interesting question about if you uh, use respite for your budget, because it's what you are limited to what you've spent this year and what was acceptable in the traditional system that we've learned. You mm -hmm. can't go right to the self-determination uh, menu and say what you want. We had to learn that in fact, you were the one that told us, just you have to talk about the traditional system. But somebody shouldn't be penalized because once they left the traditional system and went into self-determination and they chose to use those respite hours on something else, they shouldn't be penalized by the regional center the next year. Well, you didn't use respite, so we're taking those hours away. Well, maybe that's not... Yeah, the respite maybe doesn't that's exist not what you mean. Right, so when you go into self-determination, there's no, no such thing as respite. No, I know, but what I'm saying is the fact that they raised that question, we need to be clear with regional centers that that isn't okay. That's the purpose of self-determination, is to go to another system of choice. Right, exactly. Because I had never heard that before. Have you? Yeah, I, I hear it all the time where people sit there and go, well, we gave you 20, 20 hours or 70 hours a month of respite in the self-determination program. You're saying you need less than that. So therefore you didn't need it in a traditional system either. It's like, 
No, that is not the way the self-determination program works. Okay, SB is saying is asking, um, some regional centers claim that the YMCA um, that charges for services and is not answering the phone during COVID must be used before other service providers. Well, no, the YMCA is not a generic service. What? No, generic services are things like your school district um, that are, these are things that are available for free to people with who are not regional center consumers. So things like the school district, like IHSS, like um, your private insurance or Medi-Cal, those are generic resources. YMCA is a paid non, you, it's a nonprofit that you have to pay to receive their services. They are not generic and you are absolutely <laughs> not required to use them if you found something else that you would rather use. Um, it's somebody's asking, can the person live at home and qualify for self-determination? Yes, most people are living at home and qualify for self-determination. The vast majority are living at, at home either with their families or in their own home. Um, I was under the impression that fingerprinting is only needed if someone provides personal care, e.g. a fitness instructor does not need fingerprinting. That is correct. Fingerprinting, and, and in my little chart, I went by it fast, but it specifically says that. It's a direct personal care provider are the only people that are required to get a, a fingerprint. However, you as a participant can ask anybody, like you may say, you know what, you're not required to get this fingerprint fitness instructor, but I want you to anyway. And so you can certainly ask them to do that, but they're not required to do it. Um, okay, uh, moving on. Would the county worker have to be the responsible party I'm thinking this is the foster care person. Well, whoever is the guardian, maybe the county is the guardian or sometimes foster parents are the, are the temporary guardian. It's not about the guardian. It's oh, not, it's not about the guardian? No. What's the question about? I actually, I actually typed it. So um, there is this thing in dependency law ah. called a developmental services decision maker. And it's just like when they appoint an educational decision maker and that court, if the, those rights have been taken away from the parent, the court can appoint a developmental services decision maker. And that's what you, you want. It shouldn't be the county social worker mm -hmm. signing off on IPPs and things like that. There should be a developmental services decision maker appointed. And that person, um, yeah, somebody's telling me that they're a county social worker and they sign them. You shouldn't be. It, it, you, that is rife with potential conflict. Rife. Mm -hmm. Because those two agencies often are um, battling over who is responsible for services. So that is rife with conflict, which is why the developmental services decision maker statute exists in the law. And so, um, you should all be at, if you're involved with foster children and youth, you should be asking that the courts appoint one of those people. Um, and then that person can, they sometimes are the same as the educational decision maker. Every now and again, they're different. They're usually the same. Oh, that's super helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody asked where we go to see the previous recordings. I just put it in the, in the chat. It's theinterchange.org. There, we have two interchanges. One is on communication rights and the other is on self-determination. And so click on the one on self-determination, then you'll see a, a, a link for the SDP Connect and you'll see all of our videos on there. Um, okay. I think that money for the iPad can be used for something else the next year, but the budget total should stay the same. So Irene Litherland is saying that that's not what we're hearing. We're hearing very clearly from multiple regional centers that things that are one-time use that, that the regional center considers one-time use will be removed from your budget next year. And they're doing it in a really ominous and kind of um, threatening way where they're saying, well, if you really want to have this, uh, this computer, you can do that, but it's not going to be in your budget next year. So it's like, you know, if that may be okay, you may be say, you know what, I, that's fine because all my needs are being met by my other funds. 
and having this little extra money to buy a computer, it's okay if I don't have that next year. That may be okay. Or you may be saying, you know what? You know, this is for a phone. We're buying a smartphone for my son and he tends to break things. And so we're gonna need a new one next year. And, but you're gonna to have to make that case in the next year through your person-centered planning and through your spending plan, just like you did this year. Um, okay, Carla asks, what happens if you have an approved behavior therapy in the budget and you want to use some of the hours in something else? Would the regional center ask someone to evaluate the child next year to see, the eligi to see eligibility? What happens when the reporting that they ask the agencies every six months, would that still need to be provided to the regional center to show the need? Oh my, that's a, that is an interesting question. Carla, you always have the best questions. Um, so what we've been seeing is that people, that regional centers are requiring a lot of participants to get evaluations and assessments before they're willing to put anything in the budget. In some cases, they're even requiring them to start services in the traditional system before you even move into self-determination, which to me really makes no sense for a person with a disability to have to be served by, one, by an agency for maybe two weeks or to, for a month to get one billing period and then to like stop using them. That is a profound waste of money and time. But for those, for, so let's say they did, they approved behavior therapy in the budget. Can the regional center come back and say next year, we're not putting this in your individual budget unless we do another assessment? I guess they could say that, right, Katie? I mean, I don't even know. The second year is gonna be just as much of a crisis as the first year. Um, I guess it's possible. I guess it's possible. Yeah. Um, all right, so um, I put in the link. Um, I would like to know about the self-directed program or service coordinator by a vendor. Is that true? Uh, self-directed program. I, I'm wondering, Maria, if you are talking about the participant directed services that is that are available because of COVID-19 and actually some of them are available all the time. I'm not sure if you're talking about that, Maria, if you want to uh, unwind uh, that. Yes, that's the one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. Okay. So if you're not in the self-determination program, you can use what's called participant directed services. These are for rest. They're only for very specific services, respite, personal assistance, supported employment, um, independent living services, and Nina, I always forget the sixth one or fifth one and sixth one anyway there's some others employment transportation Employment's but the, the the three most recent ones are i in the in the really quick oh. non-bureaucratic ones are ils personal assistant and supported employment okay so nina since you actually have are one of the only people i know of that have arranged this for your son do you want to just explain what it is to everybody this is nina our program director uh -oh. at tvu <laughs> um, Yes, so, so as part of the directives that um, DDS has issued since COVID and, and, has, and renews it, has so far renewed it every month, they allowed for three services that you can get um, uh, called participant directed services. And these are like, there's no bureaucracy and no procedures surrounding them. If you need some extra help, you can, you can use these. You, um, you can ask your regional center, your service coordinator or supervisors um, to help you with this. And just, um, you can use the, it's the March 30th directive. And- Let's just put it by Katie in the um, chat. Everybody. Okay. So yeah, so I, you know, you in, in theory and in practice, you should not have to make a huge case. You can say, I need some extra hours to help my situation. My child is, my loved one is struggling. I need some extra hours to help. And as far as I know, there is not a cap on the number of hours. In my particular situation, it, the hours that I got matched the fact that my son's day program just closed and is offering no you know, other kind of service or anything like that. And plus he was uh, <laughs> lost his mind. And um, you know, so he really needed the help. And, and um, so I used the amount of hours that we got for day program as the amount of hours we got 
for pr these participant directed services. They, in, in these, for these three, you don't need vendorization. There's an FMS, you make sure you, you um, get hooked up with the FMSs that your regional center has an arrangement with. And they pay, you just, you find the worker. The um, limitation is for SLS and personal assistant, it can't be a spouse or a parent. But other than that, you can use relatives and you can use people you know, people that you're comfortable with coming into your um, house during uh, COVID or you know whatever the connection is with your child. And um, there, you know, you can't, once you get it approved, you get your, nut, your uh, it's authorized. You deal directly with the FMS and you, ha you have the worker send the, you know, the paperwork the FMS needs. And, um, you know, I'm still waiting for my worker to actually get his paycheck. In fact, I was going to check in the mail, but we've, we've come so far. We, you know, it, it, I have to say the the main thing is, um, you know, I think it's a shock to the system that it actually doesn't come with a whole lot of bureaucratic trappings. That's a shock to everyone, but don't, you know, that's the thing. Don't let anyone tell you it, it comes with a lot of procedures because it doesn't, it's not supposed to. So anything else you want me to cover? Well, I think one of the biggest barriers, that was great, Nina. One of the biggest barriers that people have is that their service coordinators have never heard of participant directed services, even though that's been part of the law for respite and something else. Several of them have been, have been part of the Lanterman Act for a very long time and they've just expanded it recently for COVID. So, but the thing is people never knew about it. People haven't been using it. Um, and so you, so far like Nina didn't have to go above her service coordinator who didn't know about it. She went straight to her executive director. So you may need to go to a higher level person to get this. We're working with DDS to try to get regional center service coordinators trained on participant directed services. So they understand how it works. The other thing I wanna say about participant direction is that if you currently have, um, let's say you're getting, you get 50 hours a month of respite or, and, or personal assistance hours. And right now you're using an agency person to provide that support. And that agency person doesn't wanna come into your home or you feel uncomfortable having that agency person coming into your home you can transfer your respite funds and put them into participant directed respite as opposed to agency respite. You can do that without any increase in cost. In fact, I believe it saves money. I believe it is even less money for, for the state to do that. And so you, um, you can use your participant direction, uh, participant directed. So let's, here's an example is that you may have a child um, in your home who gets respite from an agency person who's not coming into your home, but that your child has an older brother or sister. They have to be over the age of 18 to, to do this. Do you have an older brother or sister who you would want to be the respite worker? Or you have a cousin who you feel comfortable or an aunt and uncle providing that service. They can then become the respite worker through participant direction and they will get paid. Um, somebody was asking about the rates. I'm not, I, I know the rates are in the directive. I believe it's like, 25 an hour. So for the you're making more, you, you make 25 the work actually makes more money in participant direction than they do in the agency. So yet another reason to go into participant direction. Um, uh, let's see, I'm just going to do a couple more. I was told by one service coordinator that the assessment had to be done by a vendor. Is that true? You know, I think each regional center is different. Some regional centers have the rule that any assessment that you have has to be conducted by one of their vendors. And then some parents don't like that vendor and pay privately for another assessment. Um, in some cases, we have, uh, I have a friend whose brother needed to have an, um, an assessment for supported living and he's moving into self-determination and it was just so silly, um, but they went through the whole assessment process and used the agency that the regional center required them to use. And the agency came back with some huge amount of support needs for this man. And then the regional center was like, no, that's not right. And she was able to say, well, it was your agency that made the recommendations. It was the one that you required us to use. So using their agency sometimes can be an advantage. Um, okay, just a couple more questions. We find the FMF, FMS fees are very high for providing payroll services under the participant directed services. Um, 
so you are not required to pay the FMS fees. So I'm not really sure what you are talking about because it's not like you are individually paying for it. the regional center is using your purchase of service dollars to pay for the FMS fees for participant direction. So I'm not really sure, Dylan, if you wanna unmute yourself and explain what you might mean by that so that I can get clarification. Yes, um, yes what I mean by that is uh, that um, the reach, so it's basically, okay, the FMS is basically Harbor, I mean Harbor, our regional center, which is Harbor Regional Center. Mm -hmm. So they're basically the FMS, you know, and they contract out with, they have some companies that they work with. And what we find is that the, they charge twenty two eighty five dollars uh, per hour worked for our son, you know, for these participant directed services, which are basically, you know, a community integration um, and do basically activities with him that he was interested in because he's not going now anywhere, you know, he's at home. And, and the workers, they, they're paying the workers 16. So it's basically right. six something per hour. Right, right. Charge. Yeah, exactly. So the, the difference here, because we looked at other quick, you know, we look at QuickBooks, there are payroll companies. I mean, we have our company, our business in long-term care, and we could do the billing ourselves. Right. But we, they're not accepting that. They wanted to go. No. But the difference, you know, between paying payroll, mm -hmm. a payroll service company to do all the taxes that we have to pay and mm -hmm. all the, you know, IRS stuff, it's just very high. Mm -hmm. So let's say at, at 100 and uh, let's say 100 hours per month, it comes at almost $700 just to run paychecks for two employees for a month. So we find this very high because we so would like I, to have. I agree. You know, I agree, which yeah. is why we like self-determination better than participant direction. Because yes. so the, the here's the good news. If you are going into self-determination and you start using participant direction, um, I do believe that the hourly rate is the same. The, the administrative fee is the same, regardless of whether you use whichever yeah. one it is. But that money goes into your budget. That $22 an hour goes into your self-determination budget, not the $16.25. So you're getting that full $22, and, you're, and you are able to spend that money how you want. Yes, I would like to pay my workers because these yeah. are, uh, they're amazing. And, yeah. we, of course, we want educated staff and we want people that are motivated from the community our right. community which is a very you know it's difficult to live in our community yeah. and there are people that he knows and he wants to work with so i would rather pay them that absolutely so i feel like i feel like it's just we just we just tried it for like a couple of weeks now and yeah you know, we're not yeah. So okay, but we're not in self determination yet. We yes, want to right. be. So, so it's a it's a good thing to use. Yes. At least you have some mm -hmm. control over who you hire. Yes. Um, so you're in self determination. Yes. Um. And okay. So, so Sabrina, thank you. So Sabrina um asked, will that work for those who are still working through the PCP process, i.e., still in traditional services but working towards SD? Um. I assume Sabrina, you mean can you go? Can you use participant directed services? Yeah. right now as you're working through the, the process? Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm really strongly recommending that to people. It also gives you a chance to, because by the way, in self-determination, you can also hire the uncle, the brother, the cousin to be employed. You cannot hire uh, the parents if the child is a minor. You can hire the parents if the child is an adult. Um, but you could not hire a spouse if there's a Okay, I also sent them, Cindy Singh, uh, for personal assistance and nothing. They said they didn't know anything about it and are stalling. I'm assuming you mean about the participant directed services. So Cindy is saying that she has asked North LA Regional Center for participant directed services and has, has not gotten a response. They knew nothing about it and they are stalling. Um, that is a problem we have been hearing across the board, Cindy, and we, um, many of us are serve on what's called the Disability Services Task Force and have been saying this over and over and over again to DDS that they have to get more information to service coordinators. 
All right, the last comment from Sabrina, oh, as one thing really variable from one FMS to another. I so Sabrina, just to be clear, um, the amount, so it is true that there are different rates that different FMSs have in this, in this in self-determination program, but the rate that they charge in the traditional system for participant directed services is a set rate. Everything in the self in, in the traditional system is a set rate that you can't negotiate. Um, maybe a regional center so will try was, to negotiate it, but you There can't. was something last week that he was talking about, though, that, um, and it, there was something about the fees that they charge, and maybe that's for um, co-employer or the... For self-determination only. For self-determination, okay. yeah. So, so with the co-employer model and self-determination, you can sometimes negotiate their, their, what their rates are with, with your FMS, but not in the, um, not in the traditional system. I mean, not in this, but yeah, in the traditional system, you can't do that. Okay. I'm just, we're going to end now because we normally we go, I'm going to have one Edwina or Edwin. I can't, I don't know which one um, has a question in Spanish. Lorna, it's the very last part of the chat. Uh, the question is, uh, families are facing, the, the problem that families are facing is that they don't want to relate in, they don't want to relate to other people. So then they get hours approved because of COVID, but the family, they have hours already due to other services. So for example, PA or respite. So they cannot use those hours. It's, they cannot go over 40 hours per week. Okay, I see. So you're using the same provider um, for all of your services. And if that same person, that same individual who's being paid is, is working more than 40 hours, and it's the same employer, then that is true. There's going to be a 40 hour limit because they're not going to want to pay overtime. However, you may have two different employers. You may have one employer who's one respite agency uh, hiring an individual, hiring, and then that same individual is paid by a different employer to do, uh, a, to do um, participant direction hours. So I, it, th believe me, there are multiple respite agencies and multiple FMSs at each regional center. And so you just need to request two different employers so that you don't go past, so you don't go past that 40 hour a week with the same employer. That is how you get around that. All right. Even though your employee probably does deserve the overtime. <laughs> but we know that this is the only way around it. Um, all right, everybody. Well, if there's no, nothing else, I want to thank everybody for being on the call today. Have a safe, mask-filled, uh, uh, mask-wearing 4th of July. Stay at home as much as you can. But go out when you go out, get exercise and wear your masks. And thank you, everybody. Have a really, really wonderful and safe weekend. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.